Hi, Teresa. Looks like you are my only um, agent. <laughs> hey, Kimmy. How are you? I'm hanging in there. You doing okay? I'm doing well. Yeah, I'm doing well. Good. All right. Well, we'll get started. Sure. Um, so just stop me anytime you have any questions. Um, but okay. Today's training, we're just going to go through basically what you need to have on your listing appointments and what's required versus just what's nice to have at your appointments and where to get all those forms, how to execute them. Um, so we'll just kind of briefly um, go through all the forms that we would be executing at those listing appointments. Sure. Um, so I have pulled up here, I have a opportunity in command um, and under the documents tab, when you create the opportunity and you select the checklist type, which is what you're prompted to do first before you can start adding documents. Um, so if I choose the residential checklist, it's gonna pull in a list of items. So this is essentially your checklist that you can use um, as a reminder of, okay, what do I need to bring to my appointments? What am I gonna need to get executed for this listing? So this is a great just kind of visual reminder of those documents. And then you can see some of them are marked as required and some are marked as optional. Mm -hmm. um, so the MLS listing sheet, this was required for compliance, not something you need to bring with you to your listing appointment. That is simply what you're gonna, after you put the listing in MLS, then you'll create that PDF of that um, MLS sheet overview. The listing contract, obviously that's gonna be the most important thing you bring with you to your listing appointment. Um, we'll go through that in a minute. Um, the real estate condition report, um, important to bring with you. I always used to leave a copy of the real estate condition report with the seller to have them complete um, on their own and then either emailing it back to me or I can go pick it up. Um, it is also possible to send out an electronic version of the real estate condition report, um, just like all the other forms here um, that the sellers complete com can complete electronically if they wish to do so. Addendum S. So we is, just send it through DocuSign is it, uh, if we want to. Yep, either DocuSign or zip form, whichever. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So do you typically send out through DocuSign rooms? Mm hmm Okay. So the trick with um, that is let's just, we'll touch on that while we're, okay. while we're here. Um, so if I go to the transaction here, so I open up my DocuSign room. The trick is that it has to be the DocuSign form. So that's the only trick. Um, you know, with our compliance and command training, we, I talk about how you want to link your zip form account, which you still want to do. Um, but when you're sending out the real estate condition report, it will not create a fillable form if you're using that ZFX um, file. So if you set, if you try to send this particular real estate condition report, which this is from zip form, uh, it won't work. You have to add the real estate condition report through DocuSign form. Yeah, I think I'm attached. And you know what, Kimmy, I did use zip forms when you helped me. So yeah, I, I think I got it. Okay. Just refreshing okay. myself. Yep. So, mm -hmm. and then, so if you're in zip form plus.com, mm -hmm. um, let me just bounce over here. I've got one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then when you send it through zip form, it, 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 it'll work no matter what. The only trick is that you have to um, assign the seller one as the role. So um, I can go through that again, overview that once, once I get into the forms. Um, addendum S is optional. That's, this is only required for properties built prior to 1978. Um, so if, again, you're going on an uh, older listing appointment for an older home, I would just bring this paperwork with you as well. The home warranty application, we either need evidence that a home warranty was ordered or that one was waived. So um, for this requirement, um, let me do this. Let me, let me bounce into zip form and I'll create a thing so that I can pull up the form. Come on, Roxy. All right, new listing. And 
always selecting that template. So I'm going to choose the residential listing packet, which will then automatically pull in all of the required forms that we're going to need. So I'm going to jump over to documents. All right. So the home warranty again, you've seen this before. Um, all we, we need is for um, seller to either mark accept or decline um, and then sign and as well as having the property address up on the top. So this form is, as long as that is uploaded into this placeholder, that's fine. You can also, if, if a home warranty was ordered, you can also upload the um, home warranty invoice, the confirmation invoice that you get from the company once it's ordered. Um, the Keller Williams disclosure is um, the last document that's required. So um, again, just showing you that this is kind of the checklist of items that you can see. All right, this is what I know I need to have for compliance. Um, I'm gonna jump back into zip form here. When I created that listing template, uh, as you saw, it pulled in a bunch of different forms. So some of these forms are required and some of them are optional. So I'm just gonna go through these, um, just some brief kind of overview of like listing contract, what we need to know, as well as some of the additional miscellaneous forms that um, you are able to bring with you on a listing appointment. So we'll start with listing contract. Um, biggest thing obviously to go through with the listing contract is including the correct street address, the municipality, the county, um, talking through with your, the seller of what's included and what's not included. Ultimately, what will be included and not included is what is stated in the offer to purchase. But this will help give you an idea of, for, from a marketing and advertising perspective, okay, what am I gonna advertise in MLS as being included or not? Um, if your seller has you know, beautiful chandeliers, fixtures, um, just reminding them that fixtures do stay with the property. They can't just take their light fixtures with them. And if they are really in love with particular fixtures that, it's better to switch those out beforehand or really make it clear in your advertising that you know the dining room chandelier will be replaced before closing or something um, so that buyers are aware that that particular fixture is not going to be included. Um, but it's just important for seller to note um, what, what we need to advertise as being included or not. Typically for inclusions, you're just talking about your appliances, um, kitchen appliances. Um, it doesn't hurt to overstate that, okay, all light fixtures, um, uh, window, sometimes sellers like to leave the actual window treatments, like the drapes themselves. Otherwise it's just the, the rods, the fixtures. Um, and then typically what's, in, what's indicated and not included is seller's personal property. So, have an all-encompassing furniture, things like that. Um, here's where you're gonna indicate the list price. For marketing, um, it states that seller authorizes and the firm and its agents agree to use reasonable efforts to market the property. Seller agrees that the firm and its agents may market seller's personal property, identified on line seven through 11. So again, that's if anything is included um, in the purchase price during the term of this listing. This marketing may include, and here's where you just gonna kind of make a list of all the marketing that you're going to do. So MLS is the big one, typically. Um, KWLS is our Keller Williams listing syndication. Um, that's where it's syndicated to hundreds of other websites um, that the MLS may not um, syndicate to. MLS does syndicate to all the other brokerages um, in our market center or our market area. Um, Realtor.com, Trulia, Zillow. Um, you can, you know, be specific. You know, if you have sellers questioning, well, are you marketing to these other websites as well? You can certainly specify what websites um, they're going to be syndicated to. Um, are you going to do open houses? Are you going to put up a yard sign? Um, are you going to send out postcards? You know, don't, don't include postcards if you don't intend to send out postcards, but um, just kind of making a, a list of where you're going to be marketing. Uh, then it goes on to say the firm and its agents may advertise the following special financing and incentives offered by the seller. Um, so maybe if they're offering a home warranty, you would indicate that here and maybe with a dollar amount, um, not to exceed 500. 
something. Um, maybe they maybe they just off off the you know up front they say you know we know that our roof needs to be replaced so we're going to offer a three thousand dollar closing cost credit to cover some of those expenses. That would all be indicated here. Um, commission. So by default, we do have this kind of crash printed in here, but you certainly don't need to use this. The intent with this um, kind of have the option of circling eight, seven or 6%. This would be work well if you're printing off this um, listing contract and bringing a hard copy with you, and then you can kind of present it to the seller and say, you know, here are your options of commission. Most people are going to choose 6%, but you realize you're not giving them any other option lower than 6%. Um, so it's just kind of a, a strategy, a way to just easily present that and kind of um, try to uh, prevent any, uh, you know, pushback from the seller. But you could certainly just, if you know you've already agreed, okay, we're going to do 6% plus 295. This 295 is also optional. Um, on all of your listings, Keller Williams will charge you 295. Um, it's just a standard, um, it's called a broker administrative commission. Um, so if they're not charging your seller, then it will just come off of your commission at closing. Um, so many agents leave it on here. It's just additional commission. Um, some agents will even charge more. Some agents charge 695. Um, and then, and then the rest is just extra commission for you. So um, the rest of this section goes on to talk about how commission is earned. Um, I would say most sellers don't really question this. Um, essentially, it says that the commission is earned um, even, even if the transaction doesn't close. So I've, I know if, if you have sellers who are really, really reading this with a fine tooth, um, they may ask to strike that portion of the contract that says, even if the transaction doesn't close, um, just trying to find exactly where that is. Oh, it's down here. So the commission is due and payable um, in the full at the earlier of closing or the date set for closing, even if the transaction does not close. Um, so some sellers will ask to strike that and that's totally fine. We have never, um, obviously deals fall apart. We have never you know, pushed a seller to pay us commission even though a transaction didn't close. Um, I would say probably the only time that we would maybe look at doing that is if you know, it was truly the seller's fault and you know, that they had a ready, willing, and able buyer to close and the seller just kind of changed their mind, then we could look at pursuing commission um, kind of as damages for um, them not fulfilling their duty to the contract in a way. Um, but for the most part, you know, don't really need to go through this too, too in depth. Uh, <clears throat> then it talks about compensation to others. So this is what we're offering to Cobroke. So it's, you know, a way to kind of have that conversation with the seller. Okay, seller, you're paying us 6%, but of that 6%, we're paying 2.4% to Colbrooks. Um, this section here, exceptions if any, I would say you're, you're going to leave that blank for the most part, unless you have a seller or if, if you, um, essentially this 2.4 is automatically offered to any other agent who is a member of our MLS um, and have access to our MLS. There are some real estate agents who are not members of an association um, so that therefore they don't have access to an MLS. So they, there technically isn't that automatic offer of compensation. So you could exclude those agents, but very rare that you would need to do that or want to do that. So this is what it's going to look like most of the time. Um, then the rest just talks about, um, you know, your duties, to, your disclosure to the, to your clients. Um, they will need to select a representation type. So this multiple representation relationships and designated agency. This section kind of covers a, a summary of what, what these all mean. Um, so essentially a seller has three options. Multiple representation with designated agency, multiple representation without designated agency, 
and no multiple representation. So think of multiple representation is, um, so first option is there is two agents, two different agents, an agent representing the seller, agent representing the buyer. This is the one that's chosen 90% of the time. Um, there, you have a, if you, have a, if you are the agent representing the seller, you are able to negotiate on behalf of the seller, give the seller advice, work in the seller's best interest. And then you have a buyer who has their own designated agent who's working in the buyer's best interest. And then you two as agents are working together to bring the buyer and the seller together. The second option is without designated agency. So you as the listing agent would also be representing the buyer. Now by selecting this second option doesn't mean that this automatically happens. Um, it's just saying that the seller is okay with it if in the event you as the listing agent also are the buyer's agent. Uh, but you'll see it says the firm must remain neutral regardless if one or more different agents are involved. Um, so I, I've, agents are, will do this. It's hard. I've been in the position where I had a seller okay with this and I did have a buyer for their house and I had to remain neutral and it's tricky. I mean, it's, it's difficult to remain neutral, especially if you, you know, maybe know one party better than the other or you're better friends with, you know, one of the buyers or sellers. Um, it is hard to remain neutral and you feel like you're not, you know, when you can't give advice to one of the other parties, it's, you feel kind of helpless. So, um, but it is possible. And then the third option is essentially saying, um, if I, you know, I'm an agent with Keller Williams, another agent with Keller Williams can't bring a buyer. So I would never recommend this, that kind of, especially with Keller Williams being such a large firm, you don't want to limit the buyers that your seller is, um, you know, able to work with. So uh, one option one or two is the most common. I'm for sure option one is out of the first two is the most, the best choice. Um, confidential information. You can address here that all, you know, all financial information is confidential. Uh, maybe the sellers are getting divorced and they want that to remain confidential. Um, whatever information that they say, you know, we really don't want that disclosed to anybody. Um, this is kind of the, I would say the default. If you are going to put anything in the confidential section, this is what you can put. Um, and there's, if there is anything non-confidential, maybe they're getting a divorce, but they are, it's not confidential. They're okay with you disclosing that information. Um, you can put that there. Um, cooperation access to property or offer presentation. It says that the parties agree that the firm and its agents will work and cooperate with other firms and agents in marketing the property, including firms acting as sub-agents and firms representing buyers. Um, note any firms with whom the firm shall not cooperate, any firms or agents or buyers who shall not be allowed to attend showings and the specific terms of offers which should not be submitted to seller. So every once in a while, you'll have a seller that may say, I, I have this next door neighbor who I do not want to come into my property, or I previously worked with this agent. We don't have a great relationship. I don't want them entering my property. Um, whatever the case may be, the seller does have the right to say, I don't want these particular people coming into my home. So if that's the case, you would list those people here. And if you are ever in a situation like this, this doesn't happen often, but it does happen let me know because I can be the, um, you know, kind of the bad guy, if you will, um, at least from, you know, turning away other agents. It's just something that I can direct um, the, the communication to. So um, exclusion. So the sellers also have the opportunity to exclude any particular buyers from the listing contract, meaning if they are aware of other buyers who are interested in their house, they can exclude those buyers from the contract so that if those buyers end up writing, the sellers don't owe us commission, um, nor would we represent them in the transaction um, if those
Hello, everyone. I'm so sorry. My, I just got totally kicked out of Zoom. Do I still have everybody here with me? Okay. Texting with Lindsay. She says I'm, I'm back on. So um, I will continue where I left off. I apologize for this. Um, okay. I'm going to jump back into the listing contract here. All right. So um, back with the listing aid, our listing contract here. Um, all right, we'll skip down to, so page four, purely just definitions, defining. Um, the bottom of page four talks about the extension of the listing. So the listing term is extended for one year to any protected buyer. Um, so if you do have an, a listing that expires early or just the listing period has ended and um, you do not sell the house, you can deliver to the seller a list of protected buyers. Um, protected buyers are defined above here, lines 205 to 219. Um, and so just let me know and I can help you draft that letter to the, um, the sellers for a list of protected buyers. I have a letter template that we can send over to them. Um, I'm gonna skip down to um, kind of just two bigger things on page five. One being the seller cooperation with marketing efforts. Um, important for seller to acknowledge that they agree to cooperate with us, um, with you really, and in, in your marketing efforts um, to provide us and you as the agent with all records, documents, or other material in seller's possession or in control, which are required in connection with the sale. And then the other piece is that open house and showing responsibilities. So um, really important for seller to be aware that there's always a potential risk of injury, damage, and or theft involving persons attending an individual showing or an open house. Um, so this is more of kind of a uh, reduces liability for you as an agent and for us as the firm, but it's just important to you know go this over this with the sellers um, that this is always a, a there's always a chance of these things happening. Um, Seller acknowledges that individual showings and open houses may be conducted by licensees other than the agent of the firm and that appraisers and inspectors may conduct appraisals and inspections without being accompanied by agents of the firm or other licensees. And that buyers or licensees may be present at all inspections and testing and may photograph or videotape property unless otherwise provided in additional provisions. So just a nice reminder uh, for the seller. And then the last page of the listing contract um, overviews the delivery. Um, so most likely you're gonna be acknowledging that email delivery is the um, preferred method, including the email address for the seller and including your um, at email address as the agent. The term of the contract. So this is important to note with regards to MLS rules. Um, so let's say I'm meeting with these sellers today but they know, you know, we're not going to be ready to put this house on the market and start showing it until after the, the holiday weekend. So we're going to have this a start date of July 6th. Um, and typically listing contracts are um, six months long, roughly. So let's just say this ends in November. It's less than six months, but anywhere from six to 12 months is a standard time period. Um, I've certainly had sellers say, you know what, we want to, we'll give you three months um, to try to sell this house. So um, kind of up to the seller. Um, but with regards to the start date, so this start date is important. You cannot advertise or do any kind of marketing until this date. Um, you can't put up a yard sign, can't put up a coming soon sign, can't advertise in social media that um, this property is coming to the market until July 6th. Um, you can do a little like uh, to our private Facebook page, you can do a little, hey guys, this is coming soon. Just want to make you aware, um, but you cannot do any public advertising until the start term date of the contract. Um, so just to remind you on that. Um, and then obviously here you're gonna have seller signing and then your signature on the very bottom. Um, Sorry, we had an agent log off and trying to log back in. So, okay, 
Any questions on the listing contract? That's kind of a very brief overview of, of that. All right. Back here. All right, so again, going back to kind of my checklist here, real estate condition report is another required document. So I'm gonna open that up. Um, so as I said in the beginning, um, really, really great if you can create kind of like a listing consultation folder that you leave with the seller of, you know, here's my marketing information, here's everything you need to know about me. And then um, also the paperwork that they're going to need to kind of like homework for them. So this is one thing I would consider a seller homework. Um, we cannot assist sellers with completing the real estate condition report. If we did, that would be providing legal advice. Um, so mm -hmm. you have to complete this on their own. Um, you can put the property address for them and fill out the top, uh, but then the rest here, as far as whether checking yes, no, or NA needs to be filled out by them. Um, the real estate condition report does this is their opportunity for the sellers to disclose to any potential buyers, you know, whether they're aware of defects in the property or not. Um, and always best to over disclose because most buyers are going to be doing a home inspection and they're going to uncover these things anyway. So better to disclose up front, make the buyers aware of what's going on with the property that you as the seller are aware of. Um, and that will hopefully avoid the buyers from, you know, being like, wow, I didn't realize that it needs a new roof. Had I known that, you know, I may have, it, it just creates kind of tension in the transaction, you know, and the buyers known about it up front, you can work through those issues a little bit easier um, once you're under contract. So definitely advise your seller to over disclose if they've, if they're not sure uh, if something is considered a defect or not over disclose. Um, but if they do have any specific questions, they should just be advised to speak to a real estate attorney. Um, so I will quickly just show you. So I'm in zipformplus.com. If you do have a seller that wishes to complete this electronically, it is possible. Um, when you go through eSign, and I'm actually going to create a whole video of, of this because it's different if you're working in DocuSign Room. But again, just want to quickly show you since we're here. Um, so when you go to eSign, you can select a signing service. You either have the option of digital ink or DocuSign. It doesn't matter which one you choose, either will work. Um, and then you click next. Um, and here is the key. One of the sellers has to be assigned this seller one role. Um, if you just do seller two or three and leave seller one blank, it will not work. So seller one has to be assigned to one of your sellers and it will only allow one of the sellers to fill and sign. Um, the other seller will just get notified just to sign it. Um, so then when I click next and I go to the page where it'll let me review, you're gonna see um, all the check boxes are uploaded in here. This loads. You can see here, you'll know that it's fillable when you see this. If you don't see all the check boxes, then you know you didn't do something right and you gotta try again. Um, so once I click send, then it'll go to the seller and they'll be prompted. These are called radio buttons. So they either can, they can only select one of the three options. And then they also have the ability to add text in their text boxes um, for explaining their yes responses. So I would say a lot of sellers complete the real estate condition report by hand. Um, I was saying in the beginning that, you know, when you leave it with them, then you can coordinate, either they can email it back to you or you just go pick it back up at their house so they can bring it to the office, whatever. Um, so that's the real estate condition report. Um, technically the real estate condition report isn't, they technically have 10 days to deliver it to a buyer after acceptance. I would say it's very rare that listing agents, sellers wait that long. Um, I would recommend you have this completed before you go live in MLS and you have it uploaded in MLS as a document so that when agents are showing the house, you can, um, they can download it, re review it while they're in the property. You can also have a printed copy and leave a copy 
of the condition report at the property so people can view it there as well. Always better for buyers to have it ahead of time. All right, the next um, item in our checklist is Addendum S. Uh, so again, this is optional um, because it's only required for properties built prior to 1978. Um, so we're gonna just put in the property address on line 1011. Most sellers have no knowledge of any lead-based paint. So really this is all left blank typically. Um, and then sellers are signing here on line 25. And then you as the listing agent would sign on line 119. Um, again, similar to the real estate condition report, best to upload this into MLS if it's gonna be a required document to attach to the offer to purchase. Um, that way when you get the offer, the buyer's agent will sign here and then the buyers are prompted to complete the information below. Sign and check that they're probably gonna waive their, their opportunity to do a lead-based paint inspection. That's addendum S. If I look in the next, the home warranty is another um, required document that we need on our listings. Um, so again, this is our application. All we need from a compliance standpoint is that the um, evidence that a home warranty was ordered or waived. So as long as you have the property address indicated up here and either accept or decline checked here with the seller's signature. Um, that's all we, absolutely need. Um, if one is being ordered, you can, you'll also get a confirmation invoice from the home warranty company that can be uploaded um, in this place as well. And then the last required item is our Keller Williams disclosure, which is this document here. Um, so this is kind of a two part. It is our affiliated business disclosure notice that's what's on the first page so it's disclosing that um, we partnered with focus title llc as res well as residential warranty services this is our home warranty company um, it simply acknowledges that we as keller williams you know we have a, a partnership so if they use them we will get um, some profit or some proceeds from those companies for in lieu of um, us recommending them so um, this is simply a disclosure um, it does state here, you are not required to use the listed providers as a condition for settlement of your loan or purchase sale or refinance of the subject property. Um, again, it's just a disclosure. Um, so then they would initial to acknowledge that. There's also, a, the, the rest of it is just um, various disclosures. So there's a wire fraud disclosure here, um, authorization to email, consent to call, um, there's an inspections disclosure that uh, basically saying we recommend that you get, you know, if you're a buyer that you get a home inspection, but if you don't, we're not liable for, you know, any issues that end up um, being uncovered on the, on the property, you know, after closing. Um, property information disclosure that uh, most of the information provided to the buyer originates from the seller. Um, it has not been verified for accuracy unless specifically stated. A buyer must independently confirm any information which the buyer considers significant. And then the last disclosure is that we cannot provide legal advice. So that is the KW disclosure. So that's, that is all the required documents. Um, now I'm gonna go back into zip form here and I'm gonna show you just some additional documents that you can bring with you. Um, I take that back. There's one other required document, which is new. Um, the seller certificate of non-foreign status. So with the new offer to purchase, um, there is a, the last provision in the offer is the Foreign Investment Property Tax Act, what we call FERPTA. Um, so essentially, if a seller is a foreign person, um, that needs to be disclosed to the buyer uh, because there are certain tax, um, there's a tax law that states that, you know, a seller would potentially have to withhold a portion of um, their proceeds so that they get paid um, to the tax for the taxes in, in the next year. Um, that's a very general description of what that is. Um, so most sellers who are non-foreign 
have to basically sign a sworn certificate to say, I am not foreign. So that's what this is. The offer to purchase states that um, this document must be delivered to the buyer or a, um, <clears throat> the title company, essentially, um, a qualified substitute, which we are able to use the title company as that qualified substitute. Um, so they have to provide this form to the buyer or the qualified substitute no later than, um, right now it says 15 days prior to closing, but they are actually updating the offer to purchase both the residential and the condo later this summer to change that language a little bit. So it's going to be no later than closing. Um, so this is just a form that the seller will need to complete at some point after they're under contract um, and give it to the title company. Again, this is just a sworn certificate that's saying, I am not a foreign person. Um, so they fill this out. They do have to put their social security number and they sign it. And then they can give it because it does have the social security number. Uh, we say if, the, if it doesn't have to get into your hands, better, better that than um, you having to personally deliver this document with their social security number. So we do have envelopes at the office that you're able to pick up um, that have this document as well as another title document that the title company will need from the seller to be wet signed. Um, so these two documents are in an envelope at the front desk that you could pick up, you know, a, a, if you know you're going to be going on five listing appointments in the next few weeks, um, you can pick up a stack of those envelopes. Um, and then they're self they're already pre-addressed to focus titles. So the seller can just pop them in the mail or they can hand deliver these documents. Um, again, not required for them to do until after they're under contract, but it's just great to be proactive about it and as well as let the seller know. Um, so kind of to segue with that with title. Um, so there's some other paperwork that the sellers will need um, <clears throat> to have available to the title company once they're under contract. So one being the seller certificate of non-foreign status. Uh, I'm going to jump into this folder here that says additional forms and pull up the rest. Um, the other thing that the sellers will want to have available is a copy of their prior title. Um, this will save them a little bit of money on their, goodness, um, on their, their title fees. So that's just something you want to mention at your listing appointment. Okay. So Kimmy, yes. I'm looking in the, I, I've been following you, but following you on the condo side because I'm trying to learn that side. Mm -hmm. And I don't see the... Seller certificate? Yes. Yeah, so it's not in there right now because right now the, the condo offer to purchase has not been updated to include a, the FERPTA provision. So mm -hmm. right now it's not required for a condo. Mm -hmm. You'll see this in there soon because it, it, short, it will be shortly when they update the condo offer to purchase. Mm -hmm. And they have a few more documents in that, in the uh, zip form condo uh, part? Yes. Okay. Uh, so really the only other additional document that would be required is there is uh, an addendum to the real estate condition report. Let me pull that up. Mm -hmm. I do see that. So that would be something else the seller would need to complete. Mm -hmm. I see the listing, the condition report, the addendum, addendum S, and then um, KW disclosure. And then they have other things like the questionnaires, visual inspection, and all of those things. Yep. Okay. So that's what I think they're just not in a folder. I'm going to go into those right now. Okay. And why can't I find the addendum to the real estate condition report in this? Um, Condominium 
addendum to real Fair estate enough. condition. Thank you. So this is the only other like additional form if you're doing a, if it's a condo listing. And again, mm -hmm. this is in your template, um, this is the kind of addendum to the real estate condition report. And it's just an, an overview of the condo information. What are the, um, a, the monthly dues? What's the, you know, the management company's information, all that. Um, so that would be along with the real estate condition report. Now with the other title documents. So this is the focus title authorization to release information. Um, now of course, this is if you're using focus title, if you're using another title company, they'll probably have another form similar to this. Um, this is that other form. So I was saying we've got envelopes at the front desk um, with the seller certificate of non-foreign status and then this form uh, because most of the time this needs to be wet signed as well. Um, so seller sign, I've never, I don't know if they have to put their social security number. Um, I don't think it's as important as it is on the seller certificate, um, but they do would need to include their, in, include the mortgage information. Um, and again, this would go to the title company after um, the seller has an accepted offer. Um, the other two docu um, documents related to title that I'm going to show you right now are totally optional. Um, I believe most of the times title company likes to see this. Um, again, this is after you're under contract, just filling out this kind of, it's an overview of, you know, what's the purchase price? Is there a home warranty? What's the closing date? Who are the sellers? Who are the buyers? Um, it just helps the title company. And then the other, um, which I always liked to provide this to my sellers at listing appointments, it is not required, um, but it's called the listing questionnaire regarding title issues and property conditions. So this will, with every tra any transaction, if there are issues, always better to know about the issues as soon as possible, the sooner the better. So this kind of asks the sellers some questions that, you know, the title may uncover, um, but again, better to know sooner than later. So um, are there any like in, uh, disputes with neighbors about boundary lines? Um, uh, it does ask the caller is, question, is seller a foreign person or not? Eventually this question will be on the real estate condition report, um, but until that's updated, here's a place where it asks the seller, are you a foreign person? Um, is let's see are there rented items on the property like water softener water treatment systems etc um is the seller bankrupt um just some additional questions that are not covered in the real estate condition report but are good to know from a title perspective um so i always like just to give my you know tell my sellers hey if you wouldn't mind completing this just answering the best to your ability if you don't know the answer, just skip it. Nothing, this isn't required. Um, but I know the title company does appreciate this. So, um, all right. And then one other form that's in here that again is totally optional. Um, as you're all aware, as agents, we have a duty to perform a, an, you know, our visual inspection of the property and, um, to ensure that we're disclosing things that we need to disclose. I would say it's very, very rare that um, a listing agent becomes aware of something like a defect on the property that the seller isn't willing to disclose. Um, so here's the, the statement that says RL 24.07 requires listing, selling and buyer broker agents to perform a reasonable, competent and diligent inspection of the property to detect ob observable adverse and facts material to the transaction if they are given access to the property. Any adverse material facts discovered must be disclosed to all interested parties. Um, so this is just a form. I honestly, I don't know any agents that use this, um, but if anything, it just kind of gives you a nice overview of, you know, just a general idea of what, what does this property all entail um, and the general condition of the property. 
Um, so, you know, we don't want to be the experts in, um, you know, well, I took a look at that roof. It looks like it's missing some shingles or, um, you know, I, I'm not a roofer. I wouldn't be able to really begin to determine if the roof is defective or not. Um, so I'd be careful with that. You know, it's, it's things that are really, really obvious. Like um, there's water coming into the basement that the seller is not telling anybody about. You know, some really obvious things that you realize would impact a buyer's decision to purchase the home um, without knowing this information. So it's in here for you as just kind of a, a reminder of, of that, but not something it's required for you to use. Um, last but not least, as far as documents. So MLS, um, there are two different types of listings that you can have. So if you have a regular listing, so like I explained in my listing contract, that listing contract had a start date of July 6th. That means I can start marketing it, advertising. Um, I could start showing it if my sellers want it to go active in MLS. If we want to have a period of time where okay, we want to be able to market it and, and show that this property is coming soon, but the seller is still is prepping, painting, maybe we're staging, maybe we still need to take photographs. Um, you can choose to do what's called a delayed listing. So um, this is the seller's authorization to delay the listing. Um, this is an MLS form. And basically it says um, a listing can be delayed in the MLS up to 21 days from the start term of the contract. Um, so doing a delayed listing allows you as the listing agents to start advertising and marketing, but it gives the seller time to prep the property for sale. So again, going back to the example of the listing contract, okay, maybe they said, we just, we want to get this on the prop on the market soon as we can, but we don't want to start showing it till after the holiday 4th of July weekend. Um, you could technically have the start date today. So the listing contract starts today, but it's going to go into delayed status and then we can have it go active on July 6th. Um, so in that case, your, your start term date would be June 29th. Um, so this is a great option for those sellers who just need a little bit of time to prep the home, but you got, you want to start marketing and, you know, gaining interest in the home. The other option, which is in here is the MLS excluded. So an excluded listing is really for those sellers who wish to remain, they want to be very private. They don't want to open their house up to the entire buyer population. Um, for whatever reason, they want um, you as the listing agent to just bring in kind of limited number of buyers. Um, so again, they're not maybe bombarded with 20 showings day one on the market. Um, so again, the intent with excluded is really for seller privacy. Um, they did, ex they did extend the d delayed status um, rules so that sellers have 21 days. So if it's truly that they just need time to prep, but you want to get the um, property under contract, do a, del a regular listing contract, but put it in delayed status. Um, with an excluded listing, you cannot market the property at all. Um, so the only way you're going to find buyers is really kind of word of mouth. As the listing agent, you're going to have to call other agents, you know, in your, in your agent sphere. Um, you can kind of let people know in our office, hey, I've got this listing um, that's excluded. Um, again, it cannot be publicly marketed. You can kind of really just, your options are really just to use your database of agents to try to find a buyer. So not as appealing as you know going in an MLS um, where you can easily market to hundreds and thousands of people. Um, okay, I think I've covered as far as paperwork goes. The last thing I wanna uh, 
remind everybody is in your um, agent onboarding packets, and if you need me to resend this out, I can. I'll also show you another place where you can find it. Um, there are a number of different, there's three different checklists that we've created. So this is the new listing checklist. We also have a, um, an accepted offer for a listing checklist and an accepted offer for a buyer checklist. So just kind of things to be cognizant of throughout, you know, from the start of the listing. So preparing the listing, the paperwork, um, and then the accepted offer is kind of that contract to close process. So here's our new listing checklist. Um, you can see up at the top here, we've got a reminder of when you have a new listing, um, MLS rules state you have to enter it into MLS within 48 hours of that start term date. And then also submitting this file <clears throat> for compliance review in command within seven days of the term start date. Um, so I'll just kind of go through some of the items. So just adding seller's information to your contact list. So you've got their phone number, email saved in your phone so you have quick access to that. Um, ordering the sign via SignStream. So SignStream is just one um, service that you can use. Um, there's a lot of different companies that you can order your signs through. Um, I have a feeling I need to update this because I think a lot of people are, are using a different company. Um, but wherever you have your yard signs being stored at, you would or, you know, go through that company to say, hey, I need to um, put up a yard sign at this property. Um, all the companies that I'm aware of have an online service. Um, so you can quickly you know, just go log into your account and say, I need this yard sign installed at this address on this date. Um, putting up a new listing sign in your lockbox. So the new listing sign meeting, maybe you've got like a, a stake that, you know, it's going to be two days, three days before your yard sign is actually put in. So you can put kind of like a coming soon um, stake into the yard, putting the lockbox on the front door, getting pictures from your photographer, adding the listing into MLS, um, communicating that MLS information with your sellers, letting them know when it's active getting it set up in showing time, getting your first open house scheduled. Um, here's a list again of those documents um, that you'll be required to have. The documents that are needed for focus title that we just went through. Um, and then adding a branded tour that's optional to KWLS. Um, creating marketing materials to place in the property. So data sheets, list of improvements, real estate condition report, addendum S, any other community info that you want to include. Um, right now during COVID, we're not really doing new listing slides, but um, Tuesdays after team meeting, we're hosting that um, you know, new listing and coming soon meeting. Um, so popping in on that, letting people know what you've got coming up. Um, sending your broker, if you're going to do a broker's open house, sending that information to Megan Casey. This is, she's our director of first impressions. Um, and then posting it to social media. So just kind of a nice um, reminder of things to, to think about to cover uh, when you have a new listing. Any questions on maybe where to find that information? I will show you in case you don't know. On our Facebook page, um, we have a, a ton of files that have been uploaded. So in particular, those three checklists have all been uploaded into our um, private Facebook group page. So if you click on files, and they're not in any kind of particular, you know, order or category, uh, but you can use a search bar. So you could search for checklist. Um, and those should all pop up. You can see all our training calendars, really everything that's been posted to our Facebook page from like a document perspective, you can find um, under the files section here. Let's see, let's see, listing accepted offer checklist. So you can see this one was 2017. So I'd probably open, I should probably remove that one, but open the most recent one. Um, so this is again, if you get an accepted offer on your listing, a checklist of items to think about. Um, so that's all I have for you guys today, but 
let me know if you have any questions that I can go through anything more specific. Awesome. I hope this was beneficial to you. Um, just email me if, you, if any questions come up and hope you all have a fabulous Monday. Thank you, Kimmy. You're welcome. Okay. I got two things in the oh. chat. Hey.